My name is Basil Siokos, and I'm the Director of Programming for Doc NYC. I'm very happy to welcome back uh, the director and producer of Assassins, who have been at the festival before with Ask Dr. Ruth in the Case Against Eight. Please join me in welcoming Ryan White and producer Jessica Hardgrave. Hi. Uh, I'm just going to start with some really basic questions. Um, I understand that the project uh, came to you in some way because of The Keepers, your really popular Netflix docuseries from a couple years back. Can you explain more about how that happened and how you became involved with the story? Sure. So The Keepers, um, the series that you referenced, was a true crime series about the murder of a nun in 1969 and about the secrets that had uh, led to her murder. So that series was um, well watched and uh, we actually got an email soon thereafter from a guy, a journalist named Doug Clark, who was a writer for GQ. Um, he had seen a headline that many of us had seen about the assassination of Kim Jong-nam and thought that there was more there. So he had spent months researching and figuring out more about the two assassins. Having seen the keepers, he reached out to Ryan. They had actually gone to the same college but hadn't overlapped and reached out and said, I've got this great story that's about to come out and um, I saw your series and I was wondering if you might be interested in working with me and doing a doc version of this. Um, both Ryan and I had read the headline in February of 2017, and to be honest, that was about it. We had read about the two female assassins, and we had not known any more about them. They seemed like hired hands. We just assumed they were professionals. We didn't know what else to assume. And so when he reached out and said, there's a lot more to this story, we were immediately interested. That's, you know, one of our favorite things is to really dig behind what people are just seeing on the surface and see what's really there. So then we partnered with him, Ryan and he, Doug Clark, just got on a plane and went to start interviewing people and see what we could find to build, start building out the story. And that was a few years ago now. And so how much time did you have to really prepare before jumping on that plane to Malaysia to, to sort of follow up? I think it was a few weeks. I mean, we, we went immediately to Malaysia because we wanted to know whether there might be a film there. Like we knew there was a great article, but what Doug was, was providing us was access to all of his undercover sources. So uh, I went to Malaysia with him and our DP, John Benham, and that's when he started introducing us to all these people who played a part in the recruitment of Siti Aisha. She's the Indonesian defendant. Um, and Doug's article only focused on her. It didn't focus on the Vietnamese defendant whose name is Duan. So we had to do our whole separate sort of investigation into how she was recruited into this assassination. But when we left Malaysia, um, you know, we also met the lawyers while we were there and we realized that they were going to give us complete access mm -hmm. to their entire defense. Uh, so when we, when we left Malaysia, we knew that there was a great film there. And unfortunately for me, that would be returning to Malaysia a lot over the next uh, few years to follow their uh, capital punishment trial. And, and can you talk about the challenges of filming both internationally and in a country that you don't really have any kind of real connection to prior to this, um, just logistically and just sort of on the production level of, of sort of doing this kind of as outsiders? Yeah, it's very run and gun. I mean, we've done that before. So uh, my kind of MO um, as a filmmaker when filming in foreign countries is to look like a backpacker as much as possible and for my crew to look the same. And so we kept the crew really small, like tops, it was four people um, on any given day and to be as inconspicuous as possible because we weren't just in Malaysia, we were in Indonesia, we were in Vietnam, you know, which is a communist country and has a whole different set of rules on filming. Um, so our kind of MO was just to keep it very um, under wraps as much as possible. And, you know, went out in public to not be making a big scene, but to try to film a lot in private spaces. Um, but what we realized early on was that the, the Malaysian press, the international press actually, from all over the continent of Asia, uh, was quite excited to see us there at the trial because there wasn't a lot of Western coverage of the trial. And, um, you know, there was definitely a undercurrent of this idea that the truth wasn't gonna come out about why these women had actually done this um, because the Malaysian press can be quite limited by their government. So there was also an excitement from a lot of reporters that we met there in sharing their information with us because they wanted it to get outside of the borders of Malaysia. They wanted the truth to come out. 
why, so just, just backing up then, this is 2017, why wasn't it more of an international story beyond the you know, headlines that we saw? What, why do you think that was? I, yeah, I think part of it is, is fear. I mean, a lot of people don't really want to stick their necks out and point the finger at North Korea. And we've discovered that in the making of this film. We've discovered that in terms of the countries that, that we were visiting, of course, the governments there have, some of the governments have relationships with North Korea. But outside of that, in our own country, um, there are a lot of issues. There's history of hacking and, you know, big issues with uh, films in the past, but also just this diplomatic up and down that has been going on for the for years now since Trump and Kim Jong Un's re relationship started. Um, that I think that a lot of people weren't really interested in pointing that finger, and I think that that to us is also what was so compelling about these attorneys. The attorneys who were defending these women were not afraid to point that finger. Their faces were on the news every day. Their faces were in that courtroom every day, and they were willing to say the truth, even though they were potentially putting themselves at risk. And the timing, the, the timing of this assassination is February, 2017. Right. So for American audiences, that was Trump's first full month in office. So what would have normally been the most covered political assassination of our lifetimes, probably with all of the details surrounding this, this is probably the most sensational uh, political assassination ever. So what would have normally grabbed every headline in every American newspaper and cable news station uh, was there and gone very fast because we were covering Trump so much. So I think it's, a, it's exciting as a filmmaker to get to uh, tell a story that should be so well known, but isn't to American audiences. It's much better known to Asian audiences. They, they know the details a lot more than we do. So we actually try to kind of keep uh, keep the suspense going when people go into our film because I think most Americans, first of all, don't know what happened in that airport, mm -hmm. and second of all, don't know what happened to the women that went on trial for their lives. Right, and, and speaking of the women, I mean, your film really focuses on their story and sort of, you know, trying to figure out what is the truth, what is not the truth. But is it true you didn't really have access to them directly for most of the film, for, for most of the shooting? So, and that's not typically the way you work. So how did you surmount that obstacle? Yeah, it's a very, I've never worked like that where I'm making a film where I don't know my main characters. Uh, so I never met them. Every day they came into the trial in bulletproof vests surrounded by dozens of security guards with AK-47s. And I, you know, I saw their faces for that 30 seconds where they were rushed, you know, up some stairs and into an elevator up to their trial. So, uh, you know, the biggest challenge became like, who are these women? If they're your main characters, how do you, how do you constitute, how do you, how do you find, uh, how do you find their backstory that led them there, and it was finding access to all the people that were around them throughout their lives. You know, from from the villages that they grew up in, all the way to the months and weeks and days and hours leading up to them assassinating Kim Jong Nam in the airport. Um, and I don't want to ruin the the end for people, um, but the the, the 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 sort of presumption all along was that they were going to be executed. Um, everybody from the very beginning, including Doug, the journalist and our executive producer, was saying uh, they're going to be they're going to be hanged for this crime. Um, so the presumption was that we would never meet them, and that we were starting to think they might be innocent. They might actually be telling the truth that they thought they were on a reality show when they did this. So it's literally life or death stakes for them. We might just have to tell this story and release this film the moment they're convicted when there would be a small appeals process in Malaysia where maybe our film could, could bring the truth to light and, and save their lives if there was any chance of doing that before their executions. So just to be clear, people who are watching this will have seen the film, so don't worry about spoiling. You can spoil everything, which brings uh, me to my follow-up to this. I hope you enjoyed it, is, everyone. Which, <laughs> there you go. Which is that, um, you know, walking into this, like how, how much did you, like did you have a stance yourself about whether they were guilty or innocent? Did you believe their sort of crazy story? Did you even know their crazy story? Um, is that part of what the journalist brought to you as their, al their alibi, not alibi, but their excuse, I guess? He, yeah, he brought us this story, and I think 
it's like when you first hear their explanation, you, I find it unbelievable. Like, but it doesn't take long for you to think, okay, that's totally possible. And it's not just something that, you know, this is so far away. It's possible there. It's possible here. It's possible everywhere. You think about the fact that these women, vulnerable women, both of them, in fact, you know, were taken into this, this scheme because of the opportunity of a better life and this world of social media and that you can have something that seems too good to be true. Perhaps it is, but I could see, I think it's at first you find, you hear the story and you think this is just so unbelievable and also just so removed, like that's so crazy. But then I think the more you look at it, the more you realize that it could have happened to anyone. The other thing about it is the more you look at it, you see all of the evidence. And I think that that really turned the corner for us. And all of that that's in the film, the CCTV footage, all of that never came out in a trial. So people haven't seen that. And so when we saw it, I mean, that was like the time that our jaw dropped because we just got given CDs of CCTV footage with no information. And we just bought a burner computer because we weren't sure about what would be on there. We downloaded it all. And then as a team, we spent hours and hours going through that material, hours going through the text messages. And with the CCTV footage, you start to say like, oh, there's, you know, you recognize people. That's literally how we were doing it. It's finding the people and seeing they're flanked by these North Koreans. You read through those text messages and it's just really hard to refute what you're reading and black reading and seeing in front of you. Right. Um, and if I can return to the North Korean question, uh, so the film, the film, you know, is focused on the women, but you do have to provide some background around North Korea, around the, the, the Kim family and sort of the, the complicated relationships between the brother, the half brothers, et cetera. Um, do you have any sense of whether the North Korean government has seen the film? Have they said anything publicly about the film? Um, any kind of response uh, that you are aware of? I don't think they've said anything publicly. Uh, that would be news to me. Um, <laughs> You know, we had to be very careful, obviously, while we were making this film. And since the Sony hack uh, out of, you know, the film, The Interview, Hollywood is very freaked out by North Korea. And rightfully so. You know, it's, it is a totalitarian regime that has, uh, you know, done some crazy stuff over the last decade since Kim Jong-un has been in power. So we were extremely careful while we were making the film to buttress uh, not only the production while we were there and keep ourselves quite safe while we were on the ground, but also the editing. So we had a lot of uh, consultation, including the FBI on this film to keep, to keep the edit safe because we knew it was a film that would likely get hacked. And I'm not gonna say like weird shit didn't happen all the time, especially after our film was announced as getting into Sundance where uh, you know, strange things started happening online to lots of people that worked on our team or, um, you know, at one point there was someone mimicking one of the women on Facebook, which was quite scary while we were at Sundance, that was happening. Uh, but, you know, I think Kim Jong-un, I think, this is just my personal opinion and many of the distributors, I think, <laughs> didn't agree with this, but Kim Jong-un orchestrated this assassination for a reason. You know, the, the normal MO before this of North Korean assassinations was in a dark alleyway where someone was taken out quietly. This was the most public spectacle you could ever create out of assassinating one of your family members. And so he did that for a reason. This regime did this for a reason. And that was to get attention. And so our film in many ways um, is covering that spectacle that he created. And so, you know, I think we do dive into some things in the film that I'm sure the Kim regime won't be happy with, or, you know, we're outing who those North Korean spies were uh, now that we're able to trace their identities. But I think it's a story that was, <laughs> I think it was an assassination that was done on camera in broad daylight for a reason. And we're just we're just doing the 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 play by play of how that all went down. Unless somebody was trying to pin it on Kim, right? I mean, who knows? No, but I, I hear what you're saying. I mean, that that makes a lot of sense. That you know, if you're doing something so brazen, it's not like you can just decide it didn't happen uh, and that you you know it wasn't your half brother. Um, so I, I hear you on that. Um, so, but that question and you you referenced this, but like so. The ch you know, did you experience then challenges in terms of the film finding a home in the U.S. with the distributor 
uh, because of this sort of skittishness around North Korea. Yes. <laughs> no, it hasn't been easy. It hasn't been easy. It's a, you know, we, we think, I think this is a film that five or six years ago would have been extremely popular to some of the big media companies. And since the Sony interview hack and the globalization of some of these companies has become far too risky for them. So I know this is a conversation that's happen happening a lot amongst documentary filmmakers. Like what, and I know we're not the only one this year, what happens with these, these stories that are, you know, hugely important global um, geopolitical nuance, investigative journalism slash documentaries. If you know the 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 streaming companies have become so large that foreign governments telling stories about foreign governments can be detrimental to their bottom line or their business. So, you know, it's been a it's been a bumpy road to distribution for this film for sure. Um, and but you do have it, which which is great. So. Um, that did work we out, do, thankfully. We do, yeah. We'll see how the film becomes available for people to watch. You know, I think, you know, we live in a, we live in a great era of documentaries where true crime stories get huge audiences, but you have to have a place to, to place your documentary for those audiences to find it. And so, you know, we have Greenwich Entertainment behind us, which is great because they're a prestigious company and they, in a normal world, would be releasing this film theatrically. Um, but where it ends up, that, I mean, that's what's most important to us. We want a lot of people to watch this film. Um, and I think it's a film that would normally get watched by a lot of people. Uh, you know, it has all the elements of a documentary that can normally become very popular. But uh, the question is, where is the film going to be available for people to watch it? So I'm glad festivals like yours are programming it. But the big question is, like, how will mass audiences be able to find it at some point? Um, and we don't have an answer to that yet. Right, to, to come, I suppose. Um, well, we're very grateful at DocNYC to be able to show the film, so we're thankful for that. Um, and we do have to, we have, do have to wrap this up now, but I wanna thank you so much for taking the time to chat with me about the film and the danger behind it. Uh, I do hope it reaches larger audiences. Uh, and again, thank you so much for being part of DocNYC. Thank you, Matthew. Thank you.